Good morning. On behalf of the Heritage Foundation and uh, my boss, Becky Norton Dunlop, I'm very pleased to present to Cal Beisner, the uh, Outstanding Spokesperson on Faith, Science, and Stewardship Award. Uh, Cal, you and many other scientists, economists, and policy experts have worked for decades fighting the politicization and misinterpretation of climate science. You have taken risks, both to your personal safety and to your professional career, simply by speaking truth to power. You have made courageous decisions that may have cost you promotions and rewards you may have otherwise received from your peers. This award can't compensate you for all your sacrifices, but it is a small gesture of thanks and appreciation from your many friends in the science and public policy communities. We hope our recognition of your work will give you some comfort that you have not struggled alone and that your efforts have been witnessed and appreciated by others. We also hope that by recognizing brave men and women like you, willing to speak out for sound science and for the idea that people are the most important, unique, and precious natural resource that we will encourage others to follow your lead. Thank you, please come on up and accept your award. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to begin by saying that truly this, this award is far more in recognition of the, the labors in many cases for three, four, five decades of the nearly 60 scientists, economists, theologians, and other scholars who comprise the, uh, the network of scholars of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, a group that I'm privileged to coordinate, lead, if it's possible to lead that sort of a group. And uh, so most of the honor for this should go to those men. And uh, some of them are here in this room tonight. I won't begin to try to name them, but as you come by our booth, you can, uh, our, our table in the exhibit hall, you can get to know about some of them. Uh, I, I am an unusual uh, uh, person in this setting because I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm a theologian, a historian, an economist, uh, something of a philosopher uh, of political thought. And uh, yet I have also been studying the science a great deal, uh, read some 50 books on the science of climate change and about 35 on the economics of climate policy and thousands and thousands of articles. So I try to keep up with the issues, but I depend tremendously on the advice, the counsel of my network of scholars. I'm very grateful to them. But the theological issue is particularly important to me. Uh, Dr. Moore mentioned a bit ago that uh, that really it's practically impossible to apply the scientific method in the classical sense of having a hypothesis and conducting an experiment in which you control all variables except one and then comparing the results of that experiment with your hypothesis. And that's quite correct. And unfortunately, many practicing scientists have never studied the philosophy of science or the history of science and consequently, they're really unfamiliar with the foundations of their own work. If they studied the history of science, they would find, as the historian Rodney Stark pointed out, that science, programmatic science, something that would be carried on and systematized as distinct from a few little scientific insights here and there from time to time, arose only once in history and only in one place. And that was in medieval Christendom, a society shaped by the biblical worldview that tells us that the universe is the product of an infinitely wise designer, an infinitely powerful creator, and a perfectly and infinitely faithful 
sustainer, and that this designer created in his own image, one who is capable of rational comprehension of a rational universe. If you do not believe those things, then although you can in fact practice science, if you've grown up being equipped with the tools, you could never have originated science because you wouldn't assume that the universe was understandable or predictable. So that's why historically science arose only in the context of the biblical Judeo-Christian worldview. My work as a theologian and, and as a uh, quasi-pastor, I've planted a church, uh, also gives me particular concern for the poor of this world. And I have become convinced that the pursuit of the policies prescribed to mitigate global warming would have devastating effects on the world's poor. Roughly two billion people in the world use wood and dried dung as their primary cooking and heating fuels, and the World Health Organization estimates that something in the neighborhood of four million of those die every year because of the upper respiratory diseases caused by the smoke from that cooking and heating. And in addition, of course, hundreds of millions uh, contract respiratory diseases that keep them from working for various periods of time and therefore bind them in long-term poverty and the high rates of disease and premature death that invariably accompany it. And therefore, I think that those policy prescriptions are morally unconscionable because they condemn those people to more generations of such energy sources instead of the far cleaner energy sources of, well, certainly especially nuclear, the cleanest and safest of all, but also fossil fuels. The Cornwall Alliance is a network of theologians, scientists, economists, and other scholars working together to promote what we call three things. First, biblical earth stewardship, or what we call godly dominion. Men and women created in the image of God, laboring together to enhance the fruitfulness, the beauty, and the safety of the earth to the glory of God and the, fellowship, uh, the, the, the benefit of our neighbors. Second, economic development for the very poor, think in terms of sub-Saharan Africa. And third, the proclamation and defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here too, science and my theological commitments come together. As a teenager, early on I read in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Thessalonians the instruction, test all things, hold fast what is good. That became sort of my life verse. Test all things, hold fast what is good. That's why I have always been a skeptic about everything. I want proof. I want good evidence. This is the sort of thing that uh, the physician Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, said in the beginning of Acts, where he reported that Jesus, after his death and resurrection, presented himself by many infallible proofs as risen from the dead. This is why the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, that Christians should be ready at all times to give to everyone an answer, a reason for the faith that lies within them. So it's my theological conviction combined with my, con my commitment to skepticism, to proper demand for evidence that has led me to the views that I have about climate change. And I'm grateful for this award. It is truly an honor, but I must I must share it with the many, many friends uh, in the Cornwall Alliance and close with my thanks and my desire that all the glory would go to my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you.